And we start with question number one from Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason carer's assistance is not included in its proposed amendments to the Social Security Scotland Bill. Mr Jean Freeman. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Oops. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, if I may, I think um, Ms Beamish is referring to the uprating amendment, because, um, of course, uh, carer's allowance is in our proposed Social Security Bill. Um, later this year, we will honour our commitment and implement our carer, carer's allowance supplement. This will provide extra money for carers up to the rate of job seekers allowance in recognition of the important role they play. This is uh, increased substantially more than the rate of inflation. Under our proposed amendment on uprating, ministers would have a statutory duty to annually review the rates of social security assistance to assess the impact of inflation. That will give ministers the flexibility to consider different effects on the different types of carers' assistance we will provide, such as carers' allowance and the Young Carer Grant. Claudia Beamish. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. And looking to the future, um, I would urge her to support the amendments laid by my colleague Mark Griffin to afford Scotland's 72,000 carers' allowance responses the same protection from inflation, which is currently running at 3%. The Minister will recall that um, I have a strong interest in this issue as the co-convener of the cross-party group for carers. And in August, um, in a question, she told, she told me in answer that the combined weekly rate of carers' allowance and carers' supplement would be £73.10 in 2018-19 um, and 2019-20. Does the Minister, however, accept that passing on the UK government benefit freeze will see carers over £50 worse off in real terms in 2019-20, while the government saves, uh, by our calculations, uh, £5 million. Minister. Thank you. Um, I, I do indeed recall Ms Beamish's long-standing interest and commitment, indeed, uh, to carers across Scotland. I should point out that the increase that we will implement as our very first delivery of uh, Social Security benefits, once uh, the bill has uh, passed through this Parliament, received Parliament's approval and royal assent. The very first one will be that increased allowance, which is a 13% increase uh, on the uh, current uh, state of play for carers. Um, I um, take the view that the right place to discuss and negotiate amendments on uh, a draft bill is, in fact, in committee. And I look forward to the stage two uh, amendments procedure, which begins in the Social Security Committee tomorrow. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Minister, the Low Incomes Tax Reform Group have written to the Social Security Committee with concerns about how the, the Cares Allowance Supplement will um, interact with the, the tax regime across the whole of the UK. Can the Minister say whether there have been any discussions um, with the UK Government and HMRC so that anyone who receives uh, the supplement won't have to pay a, a, any additional tax? Minister. Mm. Mm. Um, thank you uh, for that, Mr Griffin. I have not had the benefit of uh, sight of that letter. I don't know if they wrote to me uh, as well as to others. But certainly we have a fiscal framework which makes very clear that where an individual's income increases as a consequence of the Scottish Government's exercise of devolved benefits, that individual should not uh, subsequently be penalised or lose that increase by its interaction with UK matters, be it benefit or indeed tax. So in all of this, uh, our officials, of course, are in constant discussion with DWP to ensure this. You'll recall, I'm sure, a previous area on this matter where we were talking about the abolition of the bedroom tax at source, which we will do, and the potential impact that might have with respect to the UK government's benefit cap, a matter I'm pleased to say now that we have managed to resolve, uh, and some of which uh, we'll discuss when we look at Social Security uh, draft bill. Um, I'm happy to look again at that to be sure uh, that we are in the right place on it, uh, but I think the fiscal framework is our starting point there, and that framework which we negotiated is very clear about how individuals should not be adversely affected by UK government decisions where they have had their situation improved by Scottish government decisions. Question number two, Gordon Lindhurst. <clears throat> To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the work of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group. Minister Kevin Stewart. 
thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to say uh, that the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group, which was set up in October, has moved quickly to recommend actions to minimise rough sleeping this winter. Uh, these recommendations have been implemented backed with a total funding package of £328,000, including £262,000 from the Scottish Government. This swift action is increasing emergency accommodation and outreach provision for people at risk of sleeping rough and is providing crucial support and protection to people this winter. The Action Group is now examining longer term actions to end rough sleeping for good and transform temporary accommodation with recommendations due in the spring. Crucially, the Action Group is engaging with the wider sector and partners and learning from those with the direct personal experience of homelessness in taking this work forward. I'm very grateful to the Action Group for their excellent work to date, including their commitment to working at pace, and I look forward to receiving their further recommendations. Gordon Linders. <clears throat> I thank the Minister for that, that answer. According to the recently released Homelessness in Scotland biannual update, Edinburgh saw the largest increase in numbers of homeless households and temporary accommodation in Scotland last year. As at 30th September 2017, the 25 households in Edinburgh in unsuitable accommodation accounted for 74% of the Scottish total and 11 breaches of the unsuitable accommodation order at 92% of the Scottish figure, that is. Now, I have heard what the Minister said, but can he explain why the Scottish Government has failed to deliver the 2011 SNP manifesto commitment to build over 6,000 new socially rented houses each year and what, in particular, is doing to reverse these trends in Edinburgh? Minister. Uh, President Officer, since uh, this government came to power in 2007, uh, we have built over 70,000 uh, affordable homes in Scotland. And over the period of this parliament, as Mr Lindhurst will be aware, our ambition is to deliver 50,000 affordable homes, 35,000 of them for social rent, of which Edinburgh uh, will get a large amount of resource uh, to ensure um, that they uh, build uh, in this city too. I am not happy um, at uh, Edinburgh uh, in terms of the unsuitable uh, accommodation uh, that some folk are in. They have breached uh, recently unsuitable accommodation orders uh, 11 times. The only other council uh, that has done so is East Lothian, who have done uh, that once. I want to ensure um, that Edinburgh uh, and other places across Scotland take cognizance of the recommendations uh, that come forward uh, from the Action Group. Uh, we will look at those closely uh, and implement them uh, to try and improve the situation uh, right across the country. I would point out to uh, Mr Lindhurst uh, that since 2010, homelessness in Scotland has decreased by some 38%. I think we could even do even better if we didn't have the constant Tory austerity uh, which has blighted our country. Pauline McNeill. Research by Glasgow Homelessness Network in 2014 found that 65% of people who asked for help were told that there were no beds left in the city. Now, that's the most recent figures that I can find. And the Minister will be aware that there is a statutory right for homeless people to get emergency accommodation yet this does not seem to be the case across the country. The Scottish Government does not currently collect data on how many people or families asked for emergency accommodation or were given emergency accommodation. If the Minister is serious about tackling the problem, surely he would agree it's time to start having some data on the number of people who have a statutory right for emergency accommodation but yet are being turned away. Minister. Um, President Officer, I, I would remind the Chamber um, that local government have the responsibility uh, in terms of dealing uh, with folks who present as, as homeless. Uh, and I expect every local authority uh, to abide by the legislation uh, that this Parliament uh, has put in place. I have been uh, quite robust uh, in terms of saying that uh, I want to know of any gatekeeping uh, that is going on in councils where they are not responding appropriately uh, to meet folks' needs. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful for organisations and individuals who have provided me with detail of that. Um, I will um, continue to look 
at those situations. I'm not uh, averse to um, uh, looking at things in depth to see if we require uh, any more data at any point. I know that the Action Group are looking at this very, very closely indeed, uh, and I expect them to make some recommendations around about that, which the government will look at very closely indeed. John Mason. Uh, thank you. I think I heard the Minister saying that uh, rough sleeping was down 38 per cent since 2010. I understand in England it's up 100, homelessness, was it? Uh, in England, uh, rough sleeping is up 169 per cent. So I wonder if he thinks that we have lessons to learn from the Conservatives down south or if they might have lessons to learn from us. Minister. Um, I think that there are many lessons that the UK government uh, could take from us. Uh, Mr uh, Mason is absolutely right. Uh, in the last seven years in England, um, there has been a 169% increase in rough sleeping. At the same time here in Scotland, because of our prevention activity, rough sleeping numbers have fallen by around 41% in that same period since 2010. Uh, indeed, uh, Scotland has some of the strongest uh, rights for homeless people in the world. Everybody found to be homeless is entitled to housing, and most people are provided with settled permanent accommodation. In stark contrast uh, to the light-touch approach of the Westminster government, we are absolutely committed to tackling homelessness, and that's why we've established the £50 million Ending Hom Homelessness Together Fund, to dr drive sustainable and lasting change to tackle homelessness in Scotland. I also think that the Westminster go government could do a great deal more if they were uh, to look at their po policies of welfare reform, cutting social security uh, and putting a, a cap on benefits, because this is adding to the woes of people in Scotland and right across the United Kingdom. Question number three, Rona Mackay. Can the Scottish Government say what arrangements have been put in place to empower community councils? Sorry, uh, Mr McKay, that's the supplementary. Could you ask the question, the first question about, to ask the Scottish Government what arrangements are in place? I think you asked your supplementary rather than your first, your second, first question. Nope, uh, I asked my question. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Okay. Um, President officer, the Community Empowerment Act creates opportunities for community councils to enter into dialogue with public authorities about local issues and local ser services on their terms uh, through the new participation requests. I know that a number of community councils have already taken advantage of this opportunity. In addition, since 2016, a number of community councils across Scotland have received a total of £337,000 uh, from the Community Choices Fund to involve people directly on local spending priorities. And in December last year, uh, the Cabinet Secretary launched the Local Governance Review with COSLA. An extensive engagement process will help decide how best to bring control over local public services closer to communities. Community councils can help ensure that the views of the communities they represent are heard loud and clear. My apologies for preempting you. Bruno Mackay. Thanks, Ms. Heading Officer. Uh, can the, does the Minister agree with me that community councils are the lifeblood of our communities and local authorities should be engaging with them at every level? Uh, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I, I certainly welcome the approach of uh, those community councils who undertake a wide range of roles and activities for the benefit of their community. Uh, and I would agree uh, that local authorities should certainly be engaging uh, with their community councils on local issues. And as I said in my answer, uh, we have also given community councils the right to raise the issues of importance to them through the Community Empowerment Act and participation requ requests. And I hope that community councils across the country uh, will take advantage of them if the needs uh, arise. Question for Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is encouraging our public bodies to do more to promote human rights. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Presiding Officer, human rights are relevant to the work of every public authority in Scotland. All public bodies have a responsibility to act in ways that respect, protect and promote human rights. The Scottish Government actively supports and encourages public bodies to act in ways that make human rights real for every member of Scottish society. We do so by working in partnership, by demonstrating leadership and, where necessary, by issuing guidance and bringing forward legislation. 
Bill Kidd. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Um, does she agree that now more than ever the risk created by Brexit <clears throat> and the UK Government's proposals to repeal the Human Rights Act mean we must be resolute in encouraging human rights, which should be embedded in everything we do, as such work makes a difference in helping people and communities live with dignity wherever they are in Scotland and whatever their circumstances? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. President officer, it is uh, absolutely imperative uh, that we acknowledge that the UK government proposals to repeal the Human Rights Act or even to withdraw from the <coughs> European Convention on Human Rights, combined of course with the potential impacts of Brexit, do indeed present uh, a very real danger to the human rights protections we currently enjoy. And this uh, is at risk of hitting the most vulnerable members uh, of our society and hitting those members the hardest. Uh, therefore, the Scottish Government is committed to defending the existing human rights safeguards provided by the Human Rights Act, the Scotland Act and EU law, uh, and to embedding uh, human rights, equality and respect in everything we do so that everyone in Scotland can live a life of human dignity. And to that end, we uh, also want to, to go further. And the First Minister, as people may recall, has recently established uh, an advisory group on human rights leadership uh, to make recommendations on how Scotland uh, can continue uh, to lead by example in human rights, including economic, social, cultural and environmental rights. Question five, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had regarding the provision of new housing stock to meet future need. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. As part of our More Home Scotland approach to support the increase of the supply of homes across all tenures, I and my officials take every opportunity to engage with stakeholders to drive forward the planning and delivery of more homes. This happens at both national and local level and includes housing providers, local authorities, house builders, infrastructure providers and policy experts from a range of organisations. This government is constantly seeking ways to build more homes and looking, forward, uh, and looking to push forward new and innovative approaches to resourcing and delivery. Alexander Stewart. I thank the, the Minister for the answer. The Housing Statistics for Scotland's quarterly update published last month revealed that there were 4,503 new build homes completed between April and June 2017. This brings the total for the year to the end of June to 17,178, down 1% compared to previous years. These figures come against a backdrop of the number of new homes compared has fallen by one third since 2007. Can the Minister confirm how he intends to increase the supply of new build housings to sufficient levels to secure Scotland's future prosperity? Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, um, the government intends uh, to increase supply uh, through our More Home Scotland approach and delivering 50,000 affordable homes uh, across Scotland uh, over the course of this parliament, 35,000 of them for social rent. And if I can give um, Mr Stewart examples of the resourcing behind that in the region that he represents, over the course of this period, um, Clack Manager Council will benefit from 24.48 million. Fife Council, £137.02 million. Pounds. Perth and Kinross, £71.235 million. Pounds. Sterling, £38.397 million. Pounds. That's a total of £271 million pounds in Mr Stewart's uh, region alone. £3 billion pounds across Scotland to deliver 50,000 affordable homes. Beyond that, um, we continue to invest um, in our uh, shared equity schemes, which allow uh, new, uh, new owners uh, to enter into the market. Uh, and we will continue uh, to work with all of the stakeholders that I've mentioned to continue to drive forward to ensure that Scotland gets the homes that it needs and deserves. Richard Lyle. Thank you, officer, to ask the Scottish Government how its supply of affordable housing per capita compares to that of the UK Government's supply in England. Minister. Um, well, I, I'm sure that there's about to be some noise from the Tory benches, presiding officer, but since 2007, 
Uh, the supply of uh, affordable housing per head of population in Scotland has been a third higher than in England. This difference in supply has become even more pronounced over the last three years, uh, reflecting our continued commitment to delivering affordable housing. Since 2014, we have delivered 50% more affordable housing units per head of population here in Scotland than that in England. Keza Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Minister, I recently visited the Rock Trust in Edinburgh, which is an organisation supporting young homeless people in Edinburgh. And they told me that the single biggest reason that young people in Edinburgh are declaring themselves homeless is because they've had a negative experience of coming out. 40% of people that arrive on the doors of the Rock Trust are identifying themselves as homeless because they've had a negative experience of telling their parents that they're gay. Can I ask the Minister, therefore, what work the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group is doing to address this fundamental root cause of youth homelessness? Minister. Um, I thank uh, Ms Dugdale very much for that question. Um, I too have recently visited the Rock Trust and I applaud them uh, for their efforts and, and the work that they do. Um, over um, the course uh, of, the, uh, of my time in office, I've met with young folk um, around about homelessness issues, inclu including um, uh, members of LGBT Youth Scotland who have done a, a huge amount of work uh, in this area. Uh, the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group um, are looking very closely um, at the situation that uh, young LGBT uh, people face. Um, and I fully intend, uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the, strate the strategy group which we have to deal with homelessness, to ensure that there is a presence uh, from young people on that in future. Uh, and we will definitely, without doubt, take cognizance of the experience of all young people, but in particular those LGBT young people who have uh, faced the kind of difficulties that Ms Dugdale has highlighted. Question number six, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had regarding the provision of social housing. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, President officer, as I've just confirmed to Alexander Stewart in my previous answer, as part of our More Home Scotland approach to support the increase in the supply of housing, I and my officials take every opportunity to engage with stakeholders to drive forward the planning and delivery of more homes. My officials and I met with housing conveners at the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities last week and officials met with Scottish Borders Council this week to discuss the provision of social housing there. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Minister for that answer. As we've heard today, the latest figures show that the SNP is not meeting its new social housing completion commitments and new build completions have also stagnated. In your earlier answer to Gordon Lindhurst and Alexander Stewart's questions, the Minister outlined commitments that the Government has to numbers, but what steps will the SNP Government take to ensure new social rented homes to meet housing commitments, ensure that Scotland has sufficient provision and scope for appropriate housing to meet future demand, particularly for those seeking larger accommodation? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm, I'm glad that the uh, housing convener in the Scottish Borders, who I met recently, is a little bit more positive uh, than some of the folk, some of his colleagues in the Tory benches. Um, in terms of investment in the Scottish Borders, uh, over the peace uh, of this Parliament, Scottish Borders will benefit from £62.678 uh, million. Pounds. Um, and I've told the um, housing convener in Scottish Borders uh, as well as others, uh, that in terms of looking at need in their areas, uh, which should be driven by local housing strategies and their knowledge, uh, and then uh, the investment of that should feature in their strategic housing investment plans. I've said that in terms of need, if an area requires housing uh, for larger families, uh, that my officials will look very closely um, uh, in terms of subsidy required for that. There is a level of flexibility that we have put in. Um, the same goes for housing for disabled people. The same message uh, has gone uh, uh, across in that regard too. Um, my officials are always uh, willing uh, to meet with uh, uh, local authorities, including housing conveners, uh, to make sure uh, that we get this right. Uh, but one of the things which must be done 
is that local authorities must ensure that their local housing strategies, the needs and demands assessments that they carry out, are right. Uh, but we will be flexible on a number of these issues. Tom Arthur. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister outline to Parliament what support the Scottish Government is giving to increase the supply of affordable homes in my constituency of Renfrewshire South? Yes. Um, in Renfrewshire South, uh, uh, President Officer, uh, we of course are doing what we're doing right across Scotland, and that is increasing the amount of resource that we are giving to every council area, including Renfrewshire, uh, to ensure uh, that they have uh, the stability and the comfort of knowing uh, what they uh, are, are going to receive in terms of, of uh, money over the next number of years. That gives them the ability uh, to plan in some depth. Many local authorities are doing extremely well uh, in terms of delivery already. Uh, others uh, with housing association partners are taking a little longer um, uh, to get plans in place. But I am committed uh, to ensure that we meet that ambitious target of delivering 50,000 affordable homes right across the country uh, to benefit const constituencies like Renfrewshire South, but also every other one in Scotland too. Question number seven, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how it meets the housing demand of older tenants with mobility issues. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, President Officer, the, the Scottish Government wants everyone to have a home that is the right size, uh, in the right location and able to meet uh, people's needs and to ensure people are able to live independently. Uh, in spring this year, we will jointly with COSLA publish a refreshed age, home and community strategy, strategy which will set out plans to ensure the housing needs and choices of older people are met. We're investing over £3 billion in affordable housing to deliver at least 50,000 affordable homes over the lifetime of this parliament, a 76% increase on our previous five-year investment. 35,000 of these homes will be for social rent. Most of these homes will be delivered by housing associations and councils and will be sufficiently flexible and adaptable to meet people's varying needs as they age and their mobility decreases. Latest available statist statistics show that 91% of homes built by housing associations and councils in 2016-17 met housing for varying needs standards. I expect this level of compliance to continue to apply to the delivery of the 50,000 target. Appropriate adaptations can also help older and disabled people with mobility issues live safely and independently in their own home. We're working with health and social care partnerships, older and disabled people's organisations and the housing sector to ensure that people who, who would benefit from adaptations to their home can access these services when needed. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Minister for that answer. In Edinburgh, older tenants with mobility issues are awarded gold priority. That entitles them to a ground floor property. However, there are not enough homes to meet the demand. What steps are the Scottish Government taking to encourage more developers to build suitable, affordable homes for older people with mobility issues? Minister. Um, in terms of the uh, social housing that we are delivering, I, uh, as a said earlier to Ms Hamilton, uh, would expect local authorities to look at need in their area. Now, I, I kind of remember off the top of my head uh, the contents of Edinburgh's strategic housing investment plan, but it's clear to me that some local authorities uh, seem to have done more work in this area uh, than others. Um, I think it was to Ms McNeil, presiding officer, the other week, I uh, highlighted the Angus Council uh, had stated that, um, that they were looking uh, to, to create 16% uh, of their new homes for wheelchair accessibility uh, and specialist need. Uh, and I think that Edinburgh and other local authorities need to use the knowledge that they have to ensure that the new houses that are being built uh, are the right houses, uh, including uh, provision uh, for older and disabled people. Beyond that, presiding officer, in the private sector, um, I've tasked uh, my building standards officials uh, to look uh, at what we need to do uh, in terms of ensuring uh, that uh, private housing also 
uh, can be improved for the needs of older and disabled people. Uh, that work is ongoing, as I say, and there will be, of course, the publication of the joint document with COSLA uh, later on uh, in the year, uh, which will again highlight uh, what we are doing in this, uh, in this area of business. Maurice Corey. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, I'm sure the Minister would agree with me that looking after the housing requirements of our, our wounded veterans' community is vital. Uh, the Scottish uh, Veterans Garden City Association, which does sterling work for our, our veterans community, has been working closely with several local uh, councils where possible to provide housing that meets both the physical requirements of disabled veterans and also provides inclusiveness within a community which they so dearly need. Would the Minister consider bringing this to a national level and encouraging all local authorities in Scotland to engage with the third sector organisations like the Scottish Veterans Garden City Association so that they can, we can ensure that housing is built appropriately for hard-to-reach groups like our so-deserving disabled veterans? Yes. Uh, President Officer, I would encourage uh, all local authorities to work with all partners who have an interest in housing. Uh, I had uh, the pleasure of meeting representatives uh, from uh, the Garden City Housing uh, uh, Organisation at a recent opening of a, a link housing scheme here in Edinburgh. Uh, and I'm very pleased that Edinburgh um, City Council uh, has reached agreement uh, with the association uh, around about housing provision here. And I, I would encourage all other local authorities to do likewise. But what also would be very useful uh, in terms of helping us uh, meet our housing needs here in Scotland uh, would actually be a little cooperation uh, from the Ministry of Defence uh, in terms of some of the land, uh, housing and buildings that they own here in Scotland. Um, the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, uh, who is also the Veterans Minister, is uh, sitting to my right here. And I know uh, that he has made uh, lots of effort in trying to get the Ministry of Defence uh, to live up to what I see as its responsibilities uh, in helping us in this regard. I wish uh, that the answers that he had, ba had, had back uh, were more positive than they have been. Uh, maybe Mr Corey can help in that regard uh, to make the Ministry of Defence see sense and to cooperate with the Scottish Government in these matters. Question 8, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government which stakeholders it has had discussions with regarding providing alternatives to cash in lieu of disability benefits. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you. Alternatives to cash were raised with us during our extensive consultation on Social Security in Scotland in 2016. Since then, there has been ongoing engagement with a number of stakeholders, including uh, those on the Disability and Carers Benefits Expert Advisory Group, uh, the Ill Health and Disability Benefits Stakeholder Reference Group and others. Um, we had always intended, of course, that uh, cash alternatives would be for the individual's choice. And I have listened to those who have rightly pointed out that our draft Social Security Bill does not clearly reflect that and have uh, lodged amendments which I hope with members' support will ensure that that choice uh, is central uh, to this aspect of cash alternatives. Rhoda Grant. I, I thank the Minister for that response and I hope the Bill will give claimants real choice. Um, she will also be aware that the Department of Work and Pensions has begun to review cases of 1.6 million people who claim PIP, including 13,000 across the Highland region, to establish whether they should have been treated with parity, regardless of their condition. Can she give the assurance that she will make specific provision so that no government can ever unfairly differentiate between physical and mental conditions in the determination of disability assistance again? Minister. I thank Ms Grant for that uh, supplementary question and I do of course welcome the UK government's decision not to appeal uh, that ruling and to begin uh, what is an extensive and significant piece of work on their part to identify those individuals who have been adversely affected by their decisions and uh, take steps to remedy that and we will keep in close contact with that in as much as we can and the DWP is willing to share that information with us with respect to individuals uh, living here in Scotland. I absolutely can give uh, Ms Grant that assurance because of course we have brought forward a rights-based social security bill uh, 
in legislation, in our draft bill that is the subject now of detailed discussion. Uh, and in that, and indeed in our own uh, parliament with our requirement to comply with ECHR and our responsibility as ministers uh, in our code to make sure that we uh, behave and act in that way, then it is, uh, uh, goes some way uh, to not only provide the assurance that Ms Grant seeks, but by our practice to ensure that we deliver on that. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Minister how she sees the use of experience panels as influence in delivery of devolved benefits under the new social security system? Minister. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Adam for that supplementary. The uh, Chamber will, of course, be aware of the 2,000 volunteers that we have recruited to our experience panels and our most recent uh, extra recruitment exercise to bring in additional young carers to assist us with that particular aspect of our work. The whole rationale behind that is that you build a proper system if you found it through listening to those with personal experience uh, of being on benefits and you pay attention uh, to that personal experience and try to address their concerns. The experience panels so far have been involved with us in uh, initial design questions, uh, particularly around the first wave of benefits that we have committed to delivering around the uh, Carers Allowance Supplement, uh, the Best Start Grant and Funeral Assistance, helping us with everything from the nature of the application form right through to uh, how decisions are made, how they are informed and the manner of the communication uh, that they receive from us and the various choices that are within that to testing uh, some of the online offers that we are beginning to design and build. And of course, they will continue to be with us uh, all of them and we will top up where necessary and look to increase our reach through hard to reach groups that are per not, perhaps not as well represented on the experience panels as we would hope by our work with stakeholders like SAMH and others and they will continue to be with us right through this exercise to the end of this parliament and I would hope that a future government would also consider following this good practice in how they involve those who will use a system in designing it. Question number nine, Neil Findlay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government, in light of the statement in its programme for government that the third sector needs stability of funding and the opportunity for long-term planning and development, how this has been rolled out across its departments and agencies. Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance. Signing officer, all funding under the Scottish Government's equality budget moved to three-year funding at the start of 2017-18 and we have increased the, the budget by £2.375 million for 2018-19. Our Community Capacity and Resilience Fund is enabling community groups to secure a three-year rolling funding commitment to their work and we have also announced three-year commitments for the Social Entrepreneurs Fund and the Volunteer and Support Grant from 2018 onwards. Support for the third sector is from a, a wide range of portfolios eh, and we will continue to extend three-year rolling funding where possible eh, across the Scottish Government. Together with a transparent and fair basis eh, for the extension of core funding, this will give the third sector a significant level of stability of funding and the ability to plan ahead. Neil Finlay. Given the statements in the programme for government, does it mean that uh, voluntary organisations who currently receive one-year funding can now look forward to three-year core funding to allow them uh, the opportunity for longer-term planning and development? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, as I've uh, already said to uh, Mr Finlay and others on numerous occasions uh, in this chamber, we have very firm uh, commitments uh, to uh, the voluntary sector. It's a shame that he didn't welcome the progress that we've made thus far, despite a very difficult financial position imposed upon us uh, by the UK government uh, and their austerity and cuts. Uh, but nonetheless, we have made good progress uh, with three-year funding. Organisations, of course, uh, apply uh, for funding uh, and on uh, the, their merits uh, of their application. But it's also a shame that he didn't welcome uh, either the increase for the equality budget or indeed the protection of the third sector budget, £24.5 million, pounds, or indeed uh, the Empowering uh, Communities Fund, or indeed our commitment uh, to third sector interfaces at £8 million, pounds, the length and breadth of Scotland. And that, I have to say, Mr Finlay, includes £234,000 to the West Lothian Gateway that this government is investing uh, locally. I wonder if West Lothian Council uh, will continue to make their investment of £60,000 uh, going forward. 
Maurice Golden. What tools and techniques are the government using to measure the social impact of their funding awards to the third sector? Cabinet Secretary. Well, social uh, impact informs a wide range of our work across government. Uh, and if uh, the, the member looks at things like, you know, grant award letters, uh, that we are indeed uh, looking at the impact of our continuous uh, and significant investment uh, in the third sector. We're particularly uh, interested in the role of the third sector in terms of public sector reform, uh, in terms of their role in real and meaningful uh, civic engagement, uh, the contribution that they can make, make to our economy, and the, the social uh, enterprise census has helped us to unpick uh, some of that, the contribution that they can make to the well-being, uh, not just of individuals, uh, but to communities. And, of course, uh, the contribution uh, that the voluntary sector can make uh, in working in partnership with government uh, to help tackle some of the toughest social problems. Thank you very much to ministers and members. That concludes our question session.